All right, I think we can get started. Uh, so I think we have an hour and my talk is not very long. So um, unfortunately, I have a hard time uh, switching between the chat and my talk. So I, I propose to, I will try to keep it as short as possible. And then uh, I'll come back to the chat from time to time and try to figure, uh, to, to see if there are any questions and we can go as long as you want with the questions, like no problem. So, uh, so this talk is about um, the work that we did uh, at uh, Nomadic Labs, my company, uh, to integrate sapling, the, pro the sapling protocol into Tezos. And uh, this, this time I'll try to, to talk more about, um, uh, so of course we do this for, uh, mostly for privacy. This was the, the main drive of this work. Uh, but I try to give it uh, to give the talk a little twist about uh, also compliance. Um, so first of all, uh, a little word, a few words about my me and where I come from. Uh, so I'm a developer at Nomadic Labs, which is a company in Paris that's been, uh, and we have a fair share of people working in remote even before the coronavirus crisis. Um, now everybody's at home. Um, so uh, the, uh, the, the company was funded, uh, was founded and funded by the, the Tezos Foundation. Um, we have more than 30 uh, OCaml developers. So there is a very strong focus on the OCaml programming language. So that's the, the big, uh, the kernel of the technology that we use. Uh, but of course, there are, uh, there are other, um, other technologies that uh, we're, we're getting more familiar with over time. And for example, Rust for this talk. Um, most, uh, a good, uh, a fair share of us has a PhD in computer science. So we have uh, a lot of us uh, have a background in, um, in research. Um, we work on a lot of topics, uh, maybe too many, but uh, I'll try to list them. Um, so we've been working on the, so Tezos has a, has a peculiar um, consensus al algorithm. So with the, there's a, a team that's been working on uh, understanding and refining uh, the current one and working on the next uh, generations that are uh, most likely is going to be BFT inspired uh, protocol. Um, the, there is a lot of a lot of the companies working on the smart contract uh, language. Tezos has uh, its own smart contract language, and um, we're working on uh, yeah, everything from the, the the interpreter to the uh, especially the the, the, the formal methods of application to the to smart contracts. That's that's another big topic for us. Uh, so the verification of contracts. Uh, then there is uh, actually a lot of the practical work is on what we call the, the shell. Uh, that is the, the, the low-level bits of the Tezos node, which contains everything that, that contains mostly the storage and the networking. Um, and then we, uh, we've been working from the beginning uh, uh, on the protocol amendments. So Tezos is the self-amending uh, crypto ledger. So it's uh, the consensus inside the consensus protocol. Um, there is a mechanism that allows to amend the protocol itself. Uh, so to 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 add, to add to evolve it over time, and we I think we're at our fourth uh, protocol amendment right now, and we've been involved in in all of them. But uh, I mean we're very happy that uh, uh, over time there are more and more people, more new actors getting involved. So the the last two protocols they were done with the uh, Cryptium Labs, which is another company in the Tezos space, and there we were getting contribution for 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 other people as well. Um, we have a small mobile uh, team, and uh, so I, I'd like to say that uh, we, we sprinkle a little bit of formal methods everywhere in the sense that um, we at least try to have a, a very principled approach in the way we, we develop our software, and we try to uh, bring back from academia a lot of the, the, the formal methods that we learned over time. So one easy, uh, one low-hanging fruit is uh, the smart contract language. But there's, there's uh, currently there's a lot of work in uh, trying to formalize um, the amendments, and also some bits of the of the shell. So we're I hopefully uh, it's it's work that uh, takes time. Uh, so hopefully you will see uh, fruits in the next years. Uh, so this uh, what I've been working on lately is mostly uh, trying to build up a privacy team at Nomadic, which is not something that uh, was a big focus of the of the company 
or of Tezos uh, up to now. We were very busy in launching the the, the, the system. Um, so in the in the past year, we we decided that it was very important, of course, to to try improve the the, the privacy of the transactions. And this has been work uh, that I did, that I mean all the, the work that we that I did was together with uh, Mark Bernardo, that is the other main developer and cryptographer uh, working on this project. Uh, the team is growing, so we're happy to to have two new recruits. So hopefully we'll we we'll manage to get more stuff done uh, for you. Um, so the, the, this past year, the work has been mostly about uh, privacy preserving transactions. Um, uh, and the way we wanted to do this was by integrating the Sapling protocol, which is a protocol that's been developed by the, uh, the Electric Coin company, which is the main company behind uh, Zcash. So concretely, the work that, I mean, just very, very high level, the work that we've been doing is uh, integrating the, so the, yeah, integrating the Rust implementation from the L3 coin company um, and then expose it in Tezos as an opcode to Mikkelsen. Mikkelsen is the smart contract language of, uh, of Tezos. Um, so we, I would say that we re reused a, a, very, a very large part of the, the implementation from the ECC. So this was great to get us uh, to get basically a team of two over six months uh, to manage, could not have managed this uh, otherwise. Uh, there was still a fair share of work uh, needed to just for the integration into Tezos. There are a bunch of questions about uh, making it scale uh, from the point of view of the storage and uh, how to use it in a smart contract language. So there, there were many, many questions that needed to ask and a fair share of code that had to be written. Let me just check on the chat. If, okay, everything looks good. Okay, um, so uh, motivation of this work. Uh, so usually here I, I start blabbering about the importance of uh, uh, personal financial privacy, uh, why it's important in, in the individual's life, etc. Uh, so I think this time I'm gonna try to, to skip this part because the, the people at Zcash already did a great job at motivating and explaining why financial privacy is important for, for individuals. Um, I would suggest to look at uh, Ian Meyer's uh, talk, uh, Satoshi has no clothes. It's, it's a very good one. It's uh, um, this is a very good starting point. Any talk from uh, Zuko, the CEO of the electronic coin company, is going to be very high level and entertaining and, and clear. So it's, that's another good start. Uh, I suggest also looking at the electronic coin company's uh, blog. They have a very, very good material there. Uh, so what I'm going to focus more is. Um, uh, more of the maybe institutional uh, uh, side of the of this uh, of this topic. Uh, so one thing that I like to uh, to, to touch base with people uh, is not so I'm, I'm not gonna talk, go too much into the details also because I'm not an expert on GDPR, uh, but I like to mention this because I, I feel this is a bit neglected uh, in the in the mind of uh, developers and even just. Uh, business developers, so just as people that are uh, making up new, maybe exciting applications, they forget sometimes that uh, uh, that not only privacy is important in general as a principle, but there is also regulation that you need to uh, abide to. Um, so more or less, I think the few concepts that some everybody should be familiar with is uh, what is a personal identifiable information, and uh, this is basically everything that can be linked back to an individual. Uh, and it is very important to remember that also pseudonyms uh, fall into this uh, category. So you cannot, so just because you're using, for example, in, in, in the context of cryptocurrencies, just because you're using a, a, an address that looks like a bunch of random numbers and letters, uh, that, that doesn't mean that this, this system is anonymous, okay? It's just pseudonymous. And typically there are ways to reconnect that address to a person for example, if you're an exchange and you did KYC, you are, you are able to do this, this link. Uh, so it's very important to understand that a pseudonymous system is not uh, perfectly private. Um, and it's very important to figure out in, the, in your application if uh, what is a data controller and what is a data processor. These are all definitions that are in the, uh, in the regulation. Uh, and it's, it's important to remember that uh, uh, there are some 
uh, yeah, there are the rights to erasure and modification, for example, of the information that is in your, the personal identifiable information that could be in your system. And I think that the most important thing is to, in general, as a principle to when you design uh, a system, is to is the data minimization and purpose limitation, which means uh, you shouldn't just scoop as much data as you can, just in case one day it might be useful to do some stuff. And this is exactly how I heard people describe uh, uh, the, the the data collection in their system. Uh, so these days, apparently, every automakers or uh, appliances, I mean, everybody feels like, yeah, data seems to be good. We should just collect as much as we can, and then one day we'll figure out what to do with that. So this is exactly the opposite of what you should do. You should try to minimize as much the, the data that you collect, and this should be done with a purpose that should already be quite well-defined. Um, all right, so why, uh, what does sapling have to do with this? Um, so I, I tried to put this in as, the, the, as, as mild as term as I could. Uh, so if your sapling, your sapling based application might comply with the GDPR. Um, one good example of this is uh, Zcash. So Zcash is a cryptocurrency that is using sapling and they, um, they, they, they claim they, they, they respect the GDPR. Um, and so uh, this doesn't mean that automatically every sapling based application is going to respect the GDPR. It really, really, really depends on your case and your application. Uh, but it's important to, to, to know that it is possible to respect the GDPR using sapling. You, you do have a good example. Uh, so the, the, the important thing is to try to get familiar with the, with the regulation, get familiar with the concept that I just mentioned. and. Um, try to ask your data protection agency. Uh, it's not always easy. Uh, so here in France, it's not super easy to talk with the CNIL, uh, but um, in different countries, it could be different. And, uh, and anyway, there are companies that now are specializing in, 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 in this topic. So uh, try to figure out for yourself uh, how close you are to respecting the GDPR. Um, Another motivation is, uh, so uh, again, we, I skipped in the, the individuals. I try to scare people with the regulations and authorities. Uh, now, another angle to view this is the, the business to business. So uh, when you're talking, when, when, com so when companies are trying to decide if they want to use a system, well, uh, their businesses are in competition. So it's very important to hide from your competitors where do you buy your uh, your materials? Who are the where do you get your funding? Uh, who you're paying and why and how much? Uh, so no, nobody's going to use a completely transparent uh, system uh, with confidence. Uh, not only that, but there is a, again laws protecting the market integrity, for example. So um, seeing uh, so in a completely transparent system like uh, Bitcoin, for example. Uh, seeing a big actor uh, doing a move, uh, buying a large amount of something, uh, could be a big signal for other for other people to to act, uh, and it could really influence a lot of the system. So this is usually referred to as market integrity, um, and it's very important to and it's a very I mean it, it's a very un, it's a well understood concept, and in in many jurisdictions there are no laws protecting it. Um, so. Mm, Going back to, uh, so I think the, the the traditional financial services that are interested into into blockchains, uh, or at least the ones that we we have the tendency to talk to and to answer questions, um, there are banks, uh, exchanges, of course, uh, more generally asset managers, and insurances. So these are uh, because they're they're they already exist. They're not the new. Uh, uh, disruptive systems that uh, some people are trying to design. Uh, they, they, they've been existing for, for a long time. And because of that, they're highly regulated. So even if they, they, they would, even if they decided tomorrow to jump onto uh, any blockchain, uh, there are a bunch of regulations that they need to respect. And um, so privacy is going to be the first uh, roadblock for them. All right, I'm going to check the chat again. Okay. Uh, so, uh, why do we think that Tezos could be a good answer to uh, for their setting? 
Um, so Tezos, there are many things in Tezos in the project, but I think uh, the interesting parts for one of these institutions is going to be uh, the governance, which is uh, uh, at the very least, uh, I don't want to say that is uh, uh, that is great or that is perfect, but at least it's clear. It's it's, it's formalized. You know how the governance uh, the, how the governance work, and that's already a lot. Um, the Mickelson language. Um, some people are a bit uh, surprised that we decided to uh, reinvent a new smart contract language, um, and they, they they were why why didn't you just use a uh, uh, the work of Ethereum. Why don't you just reuse another existing uh, language like I don't know JavaScript or Wasm or whatever is popular? Um, so the reason is that, or at least from my point of view, the reason was that um, it's so from 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 for, for somebody that comes from the programming languages uh, and verification background, uh, smart contracts are are a great example of. Uh, where you could apply the technology very successfully and relatively easily. Um, so it, it, it's very important to, and the other thing that you, you would understand is that uh, you, don't, you don't want to apply, you don't want to, to apply it to a very complex existing system. So um, smart contract languages were supposed to do, at least for, for, the, for the financial sector, they're supposed to do a very simple business logic. They're not supposed to be huge. They're not supposed to be uh, custom is not not everybody. Every user is supposed to write uh, 10, 10,000 lines of uh, of code in this uh, in these languages. Um, there there are going to be a few actors writing a few contracts that have to be very 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 reliable. Um, so it, it's a very good. Uh, it was a very good occasion to to write from scratch a simple language that was just devoted to to doing this. Uh, and once you can you you do that, you can give it a formal semantics. It's going to be mathematically clear what the language is supposed to do. And from there on, once you have this, uh, formal verification becomes much, much easier. So we've been writing and verifying several contracts up to now. And and most of these contracts, they're very, very usable. So we have a verified multi-signature that, uh, that is completely reusable by anybody. Um, and so I'm, I'm, we think this is the right approach. So for, for these big institutions, having a, a uh, a, a little library of, of uh, formally verified smart contracts is going to make a huge difference. So the missing the missing element in all this uh, equation was uh, privacy. So we think that giving putting sapling into the the equation is gonna is gonna make a really great platform for to solve to, to attack these kind of problems. Um, yeah, sorry, I mean again, I'm repeating a little bit stuff from these slides. Um, I think maybe the only thing that you can add is that because contracts are are, are most of the time they're 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 very small and concise, uh, it's really practical today to formally verify this code, uh, which is not the case for I mean most of the the work in the past uh, thirty years on formal verification of languages uh, has been around making it scale because there there are many things that we know how to do. It's just that uh, computer programs can be so complicated and can have these huge states that you will never be able to explore. Um, with smart contracts, uh, it, it's finally uh, uh, almost an easy target compared for some techniques compared to what they were used to. So let's go. Let's dive into what's uh, sapling. Um, okay. So the first thing uh, it's, that is important to understand is the difference a little bit with uh, the keys that um, the set of keys that maybe you're used to if you've been using uh, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, or, or Tezos. Uh, so in, in Sapling, we have what we call a spending key that it's, it's very similar conceptually to your uh, secret key, for example. Uh, this is the key that allows you to spend tokens and to transfer that to somebody else. Um, then we have the concept of a viewing key. And this is a key that uh, uh, does not allow to move tokens, uh, but allows you to see uh, where they've been moved. So for, with your viewing key, you will be able to, to see the, the transactions that you received or the transaction that you sent. Uh, and then uh, finally, the concept of address is, is slightly different here because you don't have, um, basically it's there, it, the addresses are diversified. So you, from your viewing, you, your viewing key, you will generate uh, as many addresses as you want and you, can, and you will reuse them, you will use them only once uh, to get paid. Um, 
so sapling so once you have the these keys what sapling does is allow you to build a shielded pool uh, which is just a pool of, of tokens where you can um, where you can have private transactions inside um, so the pool allows you to uh, to mint uh, or to burn tokens and it allows you to move them and, and to move them is just to do a privacy preserving transaction uh, so what we mean by, so I've been using this very general term of privacy preserving, but concretely what you get is that uh, the, the transactions are going to be confidential, so they will, not, uh, they will not show the amount that's being moved. And you will have, um, so the sender and the receiver, they will not be visible. So it will be completely anonymous for, for the sender and the receiver. Um, so this is a pretty strong, uh, is, is one of the strongest notion of privacy that you have uh, for blockchains. So here I'm trying to depict a bit graphically uh, what I just said, uh, and especially how you craft this, how do you join this system? How do you link it with the, with the traditional, what we could call a transparent pool of tokens? Um, so let's see, let's so the, the, the one, the ellipsis on the, on the right is the shielded pool. So as you can see, you can have a transaction in the side, that's the, the arrows. Um, and you can so and then you have a traditional say uh, cryptocurrencies like Tezos on on the left, where everything in black here is completely visible from the, from for for anyone. Uh, so here too we have uh, transactions that are visible. What we can do is we can shield. Uh, that is we can uh, so for example Alice can transfer some tokens from the transparent world to the shielded pool. And at this point, everybody will know that uh, Alice has been sending tokens to a certain account, uh, Alice Prime. So this is, again, it's, it's a transparent operation that everybody sees. At that point, Alice can start uh, transferring the tokens inside the shielded pool and nobody will know uh, how much and to whom. Uh, the only thing, thing that people will know is that the shielded pool has been moving so that there have been transactions being uh, processed. Uh, and then at some point, uh, um, we will. We could see somebody, not necessarily Alice, uh, unshielding some tokens towards the address of, for example, Bob. All right. So I think we're doing good in time. Maybe I can try to reply to the questions. Okay. So the the viewing keys. Um, so you can. There are several things that you can do. So you can uh, already you can split the viewing key into incoming and outgoing. So you can only you can already. Uh, so for example, for the point of view of uh, regulations, if you regulators, if you want to uh, give your viewing key to an auditor, you don't need to give the the whole key, but you can just give the, for example, the outgoing, just to see the to 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 show the stuff that you spent. Um, Still, this is a bit of all of nothing in the sense that you will show everything that you received or everything that you sent. Uh, you can you can probably so I, we haven't explored this too much in, in practice. I mean, I'm talking about real applications, but uh, you can definitely create a new account, so a new set of keys, transfer tokens over, and then uh, have a new set of keys. So I don't know. I'm, I'm really an example off the top of my head. Suppose you want to you have your company. Uh, company's book reviewed by by somebody. Uh, you could just give them the viewing key for one year. And then you move all the tokens to a new account, and then from I don't know 2020, uh, you will use new token, new new keys. So the, the old keys they will not give any visibility on the on the new year. And then at the end of new year, you give the keys to somebody. It's just a dumb example. I hope I answered the question. So I'm going to keep going with the presentation. If you if it wasn't good enough. Please keep asking. All right. Um, so let's see from the regulator point of view what it means to have these keys. So it's very linked to the, what I just said. Um, okay. So I think uh, what is what was surprising for me at some point was to discover that actually uh, this. Uh, so the shielded pool basically gives you back, brings you back to a, a, a sort of a more traditional setting. So we, I don't know, for, for me, it's pretty, I think it's natural for a company to, to imagine that they have their, their servers where they control, where they have their users and they control all the data that is inside and nobody else can see what happens in, in those servers. Uh, and it was a bit of a weird shift to go into the blockchain where everything is public, everybody sees everything. 
Um, so here with the viewing keys, you're going back if you want. There is a mo where there is one use of these viewing keys where you go back to the old model, where basically you control a smart contract. You have a you have a shield pool in there, and you you give keys to all your users. So or you just receive their their viewing key. So your the users there will be the owners of their tokens. They own the, the spending key. Uh, but they give you their viewing key, so you have complete visibility on the system. You see everything that's going on, uh, but nobody else does. So you, you kind of a go back. It's, it's like you had your your own encrypted uh, server in uh, in the blockchain. Uh, another interesting uh, part is the the memo field, um, uh, which was. Uh, so basically, inside every transaction, there is a there is a there is a field that is uh, is free. So you can use it. There's some space left for for you to put whatever information you want. Uh, this could be useful for an application to put like uh, I don't know any kind of data inside. So it could be it could be a message like uh, Hey, Alice, this is my and these are the hundred bucks I owe you. Or it could be something more machine readable. So it could be something that wallets or application could uh, could use to identify a payment, for example. Uh, one important use for for regulation is the the trouble rule. Um, where basically you need to, so financial institutions, they need to keep track of uh, who's sending them the, the money. So this is how the, the travel rule is, is used. Um, and then, so it's important. So at the beginning, uh, again, I was thinking that this would be a nightmare from the point of view of regulation because of uh, uh, fear that people would use this stuff to, to do uh, nefarious things. Uh, in practice, I, I was... Uh, Pleased to discover that Zcash complies with uh, with FATF recommendations, which is uh, uh, a big group working on um, writing recommendations for anti-money laundering. Uh, um, so this is an international body, and it's very it's very I mean it's a very important milestone for a cryptocurrency. Um, so this is to to, to show that um, we're not so the system is very well thought and is very well. Uh, is very flexible, and with the good use of the the viewing keys, uh, you can really you can really build something uh, for the real world. Um, so, how is it used in Tezos? Um, so, in Tezos, we like I said, we had a new opcode that we call the Verify Update, uh, and you will see why in a second. Uh, so, the idea is that uh, this instruction is going to take is going to make uh, your shielded pool uh, progress. So you can verify plate is going to take a state that is just the state of the shielded pool at some point. Uh, it's going to take a transaction that somebody sent to the smart contract and that uh, triggered this, this instruction. And then it's going to give you a new state uh, where basically the, the tokens have moved from Alice to Bob. Um, and it's going to give you a balance. So as you see, that there's also an option. So the, this is the because the what the verify update is going to do is actually it's going to first verify that the transaction is valid. And if it's not valid, it's going to return uh, a failure. Uh, if the transaction is valid, then only then it's going to apply the update, and it's going to give you a new state and a balance. So the, the new state, like I said, is just a state where Bob now has the tokens and not Alice. And the balance is um, how many tokens were uh, destroyed or created. So this is absolutely not the, the balance of the transaction. Like I said, the, the balance of the transaction is uh, uh, the amount of the transaction is, is hidden. Uh, this is just the balance of the pool, so of the whole pool, how much tokens were destroyed or created. So if we're, we're doing just a, a shielded transaction, the balance will be zero. Um, if we're shielding or unshielding, then the balance is going to be uh, positive or negative. So why, and this is very, very important, uh, because uh, this is something that now the contract uh, can react to. So the, 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 the smart contract can build a logic based on the balance. Uh, and as you can see, is the only interesting piece of information that you get there because the the state is it's a blob where you cannot really do much. That in the transaction, most of the stuff is uh, zero knowledge proofs that contain zero knowledge, uh, and they, they, you can only verify them, uh, and that's the verify part. And then there's going to be a bunch of encrypted data that are just for the recipient. So there's not much that the, the smart contract can can really use uh, in there. Um, the balance is really the, the important part. Uh, why is that? Because the well, the smart contract can control is going to receive also money potentially. So you could have a you can build a policy on uh, how do we accept a, how do we are we going to apply this transaction or or not? 
So for example, imagine that they want to build um, a privacy preserving contract that manages a, a token like uh, an ERC20 in Ethereum or FA1.2 uh, in, in Tezos. Um, and let's suppose that they want to build a shielded test that is just uh, something that has a conversion one-to-one -to, -one to the test. Well, then if you're trying to shield tokens, for example, doing a transaction, what I'm going to do is I'm going to check the balance and I'm going to see that you're trying to create 10 tokens. Okay, if the conversion is one-to-one, -one, then I will accept it only if you send me 10 tests together with your transaction. Otherwise, I'm going to refuse it. Oh, and in this way, I can build the logic uh, on, on, on the ratio between how much money you're sending and how much uh, money is contained in the, in the transaction. And of course, if the, the, the conversion is not one-to-one, -one, I can build a more complex uh, asset manager where the, where the token represents an, an asset. And uh, if you're sending me, I don't know, a million tests, then I will give you one uh, of the shielded tokens in the pool. Um, so let, let's try to go back to one of my terrible animations. So let's imagine that uh, the, the, great, the, the, the box is, uh, is Tezos. So we already have uh, uh, transactions. These are just normal transactions between users. Uh, we also have transactions. We also have smart contracts, like we said. So we could imagine that um, uh, a smart contract is going to keep, uh, so normally a smart contract has a balance mm, associated with it. Um, so for example, we can imagine a contract. So this is the depiction of the shielded TES uh, contract. So you, you, can, you, will see, you see that the balance is 50. This is the, the balance in TES of the contract. Uh, and then the, uh, the contract also has a shielded pool inside. And only the contract can control the, the small black arrows. So only the contract will be able to uh, manipulate it. And this is something that is visible from the outside. Uh, and then the contract will also manage the, will also have the balance of the pool, of the shielded pool. And if the contract is well written and is trying to implement a shielded pool, uh, sorry, um, a shielded test, in this case, we will always want the, the ratio between the two balances to be the same, to be, to be one. Uh, we can do something more interesting. We can build a contract, for example, with uh, some access control that is going to allow uh, a transaction from Alice and, and from Bob. Uh, and we could say that the ratio between the, so that, that each shielded token is worth uh, five tests, for example. And this is a logic that is managed by the contract. Um, so there are a few open questions. Um, um, design choices more. Uh, so the, the, there is a problem of paying fees. Uh, so like when, when you interact with a smart contract in Tezos, you need, to, uh, you need to pay the fees for typically for the gas and for the storage. Um, you, you're going to do this with a, with a normal Tezos account, and because we, we don't want we don't want your Tezos account to be linked to the, your the operation in the shielded pool, uh, typically you should not use your own Tezos contract uh, the Tezos account to do this. You should uh, so one possible solution is to use a, a proxy injection service. So you will basically craft your sublink transactions and send them with whatever mean you feel uh, is safe enough uh, through Tor or, or, or whatever. Uh, to the service, and the service is going to inject uh, inject it in the blockchain using their 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 address. Um, one other problem that should be this is more for design is important for the design of each smart contract. You should understand that uh, when the shielded pool is there is a single a, a, a unique shielded pool for each smart contract, uh, then the anonymity set is much smaller. So you should not design a smart contract with two users, and especially you should not try to duplicate. Uh, so if, if there is one contract with the, that implements a shielded test, then you should not roll out, uh, roll your own. You should using, uh, it, it's very, I mean, you have a strong interest to use the existing one because you will enjoy the anonymity set, a, a larger anonymity set. Uh, and this brings a bunch of problems related to delegation also, because uh, if this contract is, uh, is very large uh, and, and there are a lot of tokens inside, um, and, and it is important actually that the shielded pool is populated, that there, there is a lot of, uh, uh, of tokens and movements. Um, then you want to incentivize people to stay inside the shielded pool. But if you do that, uh, then in, for example, people will not be able to stake uh, their tokens and they will not, manage, they will not get uh, the rewards from that. So this could be uh, a disadvantage. So there are ways to, to delegate the balance of a, of a smart contract to a, to a block producer to get the rewards, but this complicates quite a bit the logic of the, and the design of the smart contract. Um, so the, the way forward, uh, well, this is going to be proposed uh, soon, uh, in, I think, uh, end of May, and it could be activated during the summer. 
um, we're working on more privacy uh, protecting primitives, especially the, uh, I'm excited about the set membership. Uh, in the example I was giving before, uh, the access control was, uh, I was saying it would be nice to have access control to a smart contract. This is a very standard uh, feature. Um, but the thing is that it's, it's going to be in clear. So in, in that smart contract, Alice and Bob, everybody can see that Alice and Bob can access the, the contract. Uh, what it would be nice is actually to have a, um, a private set where um, the set could be, so we have the list of people and this could be public or not. But I mean, imagine you have a set of users and a user can just send a proof that they belong to that set uh, without revealing which, which, who they are in that set. Uh, said, so this would allow to do some uh, some private access control. Um, and this is related to more work on identity that I hope we'll all get time to do next year. And then more practical, more immediate work is going to be to to enable wallets to use sapling because there is quite a bit of work. It's a bit more complicated. Uh, but we have also, so we, we've been working on, on our uh, wallet, um, the Tezos client. And we've been, um, and there are other companies interested in building uh, wallets with, with Sapling uh, uh, inside. Uh, another another interest uh, work for the future is the multi-asset pool that uh, the people at Creepium Labs are working on. There's going to be a shielded pool where you can have uh, several assets inside, not just one. So this could uh, potentially increase a lot the size of the, the anonymity set. And that's it. So I'm going to stop sharing for now, unless there's a reason to go back to the presentation. And I'm going to give me a second look at the chat. Uh, and if you want to jump into the discussion with your audio and video, don't, don't hesitate. Uh, so to to reply to the question, uh, yeah. So the, the total balance of the shielded pool is uh, is public. Um, yeah. So basically, there's no there nowhere is written. Uh, this is the balance, but it's just you can reconstruct just by looking at replaying all the transactions that have been applied to the to the pool. You can you can reconstruct what's the current balance. Um, and yes, you can have multiple shielded pools for a single contract. Uh, so you could, uh, so let's put it this way. So this is a good, it, it's interesting with respect to the multi-asset uh, shielded pool. Uh, suppose I want to to have um, a pool where I have two assets. Right now with what we have, you can build a contract with two shielded pools, which means that uh, we will be able to see everything that goes into token one and token two and interactions between the two. Um, it would be actually be nicer to have one single shooted pool where you can uh, sort of color each token inside and nobody will be able to see the colors. Um, and in this way, uh, from the outside, you will see the two, the two tokens mixed and you will, you will have better privacy for that. Um, uh, but right now, let's say at the cost of having less privacy, you can have uh, uh, multiple shooted pools. So, so my, my examples about uh, I don't know, taxes and et cetera, they're, they're a bit naive. I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that's a concrete example. Um, so let, I can give you a little bit um, examples of what I think is useful and what actually I've been, uh, the questions I've been, we've been asked. So stuff that people ask about is always about building uh, STOs or uh, asset management contracts. Uh, the reason for that is because um, well, they see a lot of potential in the blockchain to, to lower the cost and, and make it easier for them to... Uh... So basically, a lot of people have interested in assets that are too complicated or too peculiar to, to, uh, to be interesting for a, a regular bank or a, or a regular traditional system. The, I mean, the cost that would be exorbitant with respect to the... Uh... Oh, hi, Harry. So let, uh, I'm just finished about this and I reply to the question. Um, uh, so for a lot of people, they see a lot of opportunities in this, uh, and privacy is a big, uh, again, it's a big problem. So even for, for the tiniest of application, uh, it's important to have privacy. So for them, it's interesting to be able to have uh, a platform where uh, you have uh, uh, formally, very, like I said, you, you know the governance, you know what's going uh, to happen. You trust the technology because it's, uh, 
it's the good stuff uh, functional programming languages uh, written by people coming from research etc cetera, etc cetera. you have your formal verification of contract you can you can have somebody verify the contract for you um, and then you have your uh, you basically you live in your you have your little space in the blockchain because by using the uh, the viewing keys you can actually like uh, really the simple example I was giving you can just control have the viewing keys of your users and control everything that's going on uh, for users it's still interesting because um, usually they, they trust so in this system there is always uh, intermediaries that you that you trust in the sense that you can you can sue them so basically it's in, as much as the decentralization it's uh, it's it's a very interesting uh, Thing for me, having a system where every where, where the the code code is law, the code is going to control what's going on, uh, and there is no um, nobody which has more weight than, than the others. In practice, in this in, in real system, the result you actually want uh, an intermediary. You want something in the middle, some, somebody in the middle that is going to add cost and, and complication probably, but it's somebody that you can that is going to be liable for some for for any problems. Uh, so actually, in most of the system, you will have somebody that is managing the contract and that is managing keys and that you can sue if somebody goes wrong uh, that can help you if you do something stupid like using your keys um, so this is i think this this is the case that i hope uh, to see uh, in the next year it shouldn't be i'm not talking about uh, 10 years away i think next year we will see people doing uh, small contracts stos uh, using sapling um, so from from banks and government, uh, so I haven't had a lot of contact with government. It's more I more had contacts with uh, um, with regulators from the government that are curious about this stuff and they want to understand is it, is is it dangerous? Is it uh, interesting for some of the stuff? So they they just want to understand basically. So I, I didn't hear about any concrete use case. Um, the uh, so from banks. Um, so banks again are interested. I think most of the interest is in STOs, uh, maybe building platform for STOs or, or things like that. And so the same applies to what I was saying before. Um, what else? Uh, from central banks, which is a bit different than banks. Uh, so the uh, Bank of France is very active in uh, blockchains. They're very curious. They have a lab where they. Uh, where they talk to a bunch of people and they experiment with several technologies. And I think, so they, they put out um, a call for applications for, uh, and it was most, so I think right now they're curious about uh, stable coins. So this is very different to what we do. Um, but at some point uh, they know that it will hit the, the privacy problem. So they're interesting. So I, I try to, I explain to them what something does and how, et cetera. Um, they're interested in uh, in seeing if it could be a solution for their privacy problems, uh, but most of this stuff is very speculative. They're not really gonna roll out anything uh, uh, next year. They're just trying to uh, to fill the waters and see. Uh, so to to answer Harry, um, yeah. So for example, uh, what I was saying before that you don't want to inject the the transaction yourself because otherwise it can be linked uh, to your uh, Tezos address. What you would like is to have a service where you can send the, the transaction to and they will send it for you. Or in the example I was saying, if you, you, you will send your transaction, you will craft your transaction and sign it with your, with your spending key, send it to, to the manager of the contract that is managing the asset, uh, and then they will take care of, of uh, transmitting it to the smart contract. Uh, so the question is, do you trust uh, this, this intermediary or not? So in, if it is the manager of the contract, probably you do trust them that they will inject it. Um, and plus, maybe they have the view, your viewing key, so you don't really care about the privacy. Um, but if, say, that is another service, then they will know that your, your IP even worse than... They will. So if it is just a random website, uh, you have another set of problems. So the, the way that we're, we were planning to build one of this, uh, a simple example of how to do an injection system, and we were gonna do it as a Tor hidden service. So you will just uh, send your transaction through Tor uh, to, a, to a website, uh, and this website will, uh, will run next to a node, and it will just inject the transaction in the node. Uh, so there are definitely a lot of questions like, uh, um, 
let's say that uh, I don't know. So I think we're still uh, in the infant. So I'm, I haven't seen a lot of analysis, uh, especially in Tezos, of what happens at the peer-to-peer -peer level, at the network level. Um, just because it's a gossip network, you get the feeling that, oh, everything is going to be very redundant and there's going to be a lot of noise and we'll not really see traffic from somebody. But in practice, these networks are very, so I'm not sure what, how decentralized really are these networks. Maybe there, there are some big stars and actually you, you will, most people will go through, uh, I, don't, I don't know what's the diameters of this, of the network actually. So it could be uh, quite tricky to maintain actually your privacy if you're the one injecting your, your transaction from home, for example. And I mean, an IP address says much, much more than, uh, than a Tezos address. Uh, so to be, so uh, anybody could do, could have one of these services. The, and uh, the, the incentive to do this is that I would put some fees inside my uh, shielded transaction. So uh, you will receive uh, shielded tokens uh, as a payment for the transactions. Um, so it's um, it's a bit so for some use cases it works well from others a bit less uh, but yeah basically that's the, the idea so if I'm doing a shielded test I would just uh, put in the transaction I'm gonna um, so you, uh, if you advertise your service and you say okay this is my service uh, injection service with an address uh, I will take the address I will put it in my transaction adding some fees for you and then I will upload my transaction to your website and then you will inject it for me, and you will and you will be able to claim back the the, the fees. There, there is a certain level of. I mean, even if you're using it through Tor, there is a certain level of trust in some of these services. So uh, you should just uh, I don't know, check a little bit their code to make sure. Yeah, yeah. So the sorry to reply to you, Harry. Uh, again, we discussed a little bit about uh, mixed nets as well. Um, it's not so. I'm not sure. So last time I talked with some people at Indria, we we mentioned this. And we were wondering, I was wondering if um, uh, in the, the, the consensus people, so the, the consensus team is also very, uh, so they're concerned with the communication complexity of the network just for efficiency reasons and also for privacy reasons. So I was wondering if they could use, uh, if they, I mean, if the needs of uh, privacy and consensus intersect somewhere. And so maybe it would be interesting to, um, to deploy some of these technologies in the peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, so the adoption of Mikkelsen. Uh, so the adoption of Mikkelsen, I, I think, is very low because most people don't really use Mikkelsen because uh, Mikkelsen is kind of the, the, the low-level uh, code that is interpreted on the blockchain. Um, they, most, they usually use, uh, I, I see two high-level languages that are the most popular, uh, Ligo and uh, SmartPy. Uh, that they compile to Mikkelsen. And I think they're they're gaining a lot of popularity. So I think, uh, Ligo arrived first, so maybe it has a bit more history and people are more used to it. Uh, I've seen SmartPy gaining in popularity in more recently. Uh, they're two very good teams, frankly. So I don't know, we, we, we know them. They're, they're very, both uh, very good teams. And we try to, um, whenever we do, uh, we do training, we organize training days, onboarding days in uh, at Nomadic where we invite companies to come and we explain to them how to use Tezos. And um, we invite them, we invite the people from SmartPy and Ligo to come and talk, and they, they're, it's always very, uh, very good quality. Um, so I think the adoption is good. Uh, the question is more, what's the adoption of blockchains in the world? So uh, I don't know how much of this stuff it's, um, uh, it's being deployed. Uh, and then there's also the question that when you, when you, even if I see smart contracts being deployed on the network, I don't know if they were compiled from Ligo or, or from SmartPy. So concretely, I, I don't know. I can give you a feeling that these are the two popular languages, and I think they're doing quite well in terms of uh, tooling and, and ease of use. Um, so it's mostly focused in Europe. So uh, I, I was hoping not to hear this. So I, I, I'm, I'm always afraid that people will label uh, Tezos as a French uh, blockchain. Or a European blockchain. Actually, Tezos is, I think, is was born in the U.S. probably, and then some of the develop, most of the development was done in um, in, in Paris. Uh, but frankly, is is a is a project that tries to really push for decentralization. So there is a lot of uh, uh, there are a lot of people in the U.S. Uh, very active. Uh, you, you will see that uh, the other talks on on these sessions they're from the people at TQ, uh, that is a company in New York, that are they're doing a lot of interesting stuff. 
uh, Decryptium Labs, the other company I mentioned, is in Switzerland. Uh, I, I, so there are very good people in Berlin uh, working on Tezos. So um, I hope is not, and, and there are not become, I mean, a big actor, let's say, in, uh, uh, in Japan. So there, it's a very decentralized uh, uh, ecosystem. So uh, hopefully it's not going to be mostly focused in Europe. It's going to be more. I, I, of course, I, I, I live here in Paris, so I, I can give you my vision that is going to be very, it's going to be a cone here in, in France, but uh, there's, there's much more going on. Uh, so the, my hope for uh, for Protocol 007 is to be released uh, the end of this month. I'm really it's my like my 100% of my time is devoted to that. It's just that there is a yeah there is a lot of delays and uh, uh, we're at the point where we we write more code that we can review. So it's a bit tricky. There are, there are a lot of uh, good merge requests that are waiting in line just to be reviewed to make sure that uh, the quality is good because it, it, it's easy to let uh, bugs slip. So yeah, uh, I hope that by the end of May we will inject, uh, we'll propose the protocol. So I've been going on for an hour. I'm not sure if you have more questions, I can keep going. Um, otherwise, I think the other sessions are going to start. So I think I will just thank everybody. It was very nice to see all this feedback um, and. Uh, I hope uh, it was uh, informative, uh, and don't hesitate to to con contact us if you contact me if you have more questions. Okay, enjoy the rest of the conference.